How's everybody doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I'm your host, Dr. Joe Berquist. This is our weekly banking update for uh, April 28th. And I'm coming to you live here from a, well, not live, but <laughs> pre-recorded. But uh, I'm coming to you from a beautiful day here in uh, Pennsylvania. Definitely our, our nicest day of the year up to this point. Uh, Mid 80s, beautiful sun outside. It was just a great day uh, to be outside. So that's why this uh, uh, video is coming to you a little bit later in the day here than usual because uh, I was outside having a good time. So, but uh, anyway, a lot, lot of stuff happening this weekend. Obviously, we had the Republic Bank failure on Friday afternoon, uh, which made, uh, you know, kind of a bunch of news on uh, Friday night and into Saturday. Uh, I just did an episode on that. Uh, so you can go and check that out. I just posted that up along with this episode. So if you kind of want the story there on, on Republic Bank, go check that out. Uh, if you need more details on the Republic Bank, uh, go back to episode number 79, uh, where I basically go through the whole kind of uh, two-year saga of what was going on there with Republic Bank, if you want a lot more in-depth uh, detail on that. So, uh, and then just a couple other things to note uh, before we kind of get into the numbers here and some of the things I want to hit and talk about this week. So, um, I posted up two great interviews uh, earlier today. I did an interview with Brian Nestor from Nestor Insurance. Uh, you know, Brian is uh, basically a, a health insurance broker and administrator. And uh, he, you know, just we had a great conversation about getting health insurance for small to medium sized businesses and just all the nuance of that. What are the ins and outs of it? Uh, what are things that people should be looking for? So if you, you know, if you do own a small to medium sized business and uh, maybe you're, you've are you got some health care or health insurance questions, health benefits questions, uh, definitely worth checking out that interview. The second interview, I'm very, very happy to say was my very first CEO interview, and I interviewed a gentleman named Robert White, who is the CEO of First Colonial Community Bank uh, here in Pennsylvania. The bank is based and in, and in, in works out of both PA and New Jersey. Uh, but Bob was kind enough to come on and do the interview, and we we hit on a whole range of topics. We talk about Bob's career, you know, kind of how he got into the the CEO job. We talk about the history, the background of First Colonial Bank. Uh, and then we kind of, you know, we kind of wrap up with just, you know, just getting some general thoughts on the regulatory environment and um, uh, as well as kind of what, you know, what he sees with with banking the rest of the year, you know, kind of what's going on. What is, he, what is his take on interest rates, deposits, uh, profit margins, all that that good fun stuff. So, uh, so that was a great interview. So I definitely highly recommend it and, and hope people will go and check it out. So with that. Let's first start off with, uh, so what are some of the economic indicators that we have coming up this week? So on April 30th, we have Employment Cost Index. We get the Chicago PMI and we get the CB Consumer Confidence, and that's all coming on, on Tuesday. On Wednesday, May 1st, uh, we get the ADP Non-Farm Employment Change. We get Manufacturing PMI. We get the JOLTS job openings. We get the FOMC statement. Uh, so that'll be a big thing seeing, you know, comments from Jeremy Powell. I'm really not expecting any change or anything there. It's basically going to be more of the we're standing holding pat for the moment. Uh, Fed interest rate decision, again, holding pat. Uh, FOMC press conference. So so Wednesday will be a, a Wednesday will be a big day. On Thursday, May 2nd, we get the initial jobless claims, we get the trade balance, we get uh, factory orders, and then on Friday, we get the average hourly earnings, non-farm payroll, uh, unemployment rate, uh, services, PMI, and then we get the U.S. Uh, Baker Hughes total rate count. So uh, so some, some big days coming up. Uh, we get basically a lot of employment data this week with, uh, you know, non-farm uh, payrolls and employment rate. We've got all the FOMC stuff happening on Wednesday, along with the jolts and the ADP non-farm employment change. So, you know, we're going to get a lot of information there uh, coming up this week. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of interesting information that we're going to see coming up. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, economic indicators that we had from last week in just a second, along with, you know, the, uh, what happened with, with GDP. Um, but uh, a couple things that I wanted to hit on, uh, just a, a couple things that came up. There were three things that I saw that were really interesting. So first up was the Supreme Court made a decision that could have a ripple effect on the development of what's called impact fees from townships. 
So a recent decision by the U.S. Supreme Court could have ripple effects on the types of impact fees levied on new developments across the United States. The Supreme Court justice, justices unanimously ruled on April 12th in favor of George Sheets in Sheets v. El Dorado County, in which the petitioner was required to pay a $23,420 county traffic impact fee to build a prefabricated house on a lot he owned in Placerville, California. Sheets paid the fee and successfully obtained the permit, but he also filed a lawsuit over the fee in state court, and the case ultimately made its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, now, Sheets argued that the traffic impact fee imposed to obtain the needed permit constituted an unlawful extraction of money in violation of the Constitution's takings clause, which says private property can't be taken by the government for public use without just compensation. He also argued two previous court cases um, uh, let's see here. They required El Dorado County to make an individualized determination that the fee imposed on him was necessary to offset traffic congestion contributable to his project. Um, let's see here. The Supreme Court in its decision ruled that nothing in constitutional text history or unprecedented supports exempting legislatures from ordinary taking rules. Um, so the case is going now will revert to the California courts to decide whether Sheets will get his $23,000 payment refunded. Uh, those familiar with the real estate industry in the case say the Supreme Court's ruling has wide ranging impl implications for impact fees and jurisdictions across the U.S. Um, a lot of developers and builders have been chafing under the increased use of impact fees to fund local government operations. And in California, I think that's understandable, said David Robinson, a law partner at law firm Holland and Knight, uh, noting that in California in particular, the state's Proposition 13 law caps how much property taxes can be raised. Uh, so it, here's the interesting thing about impact fees. So um, if I am, I'll take a, uh, let, let's take a, let's, let's think about this. Let's take a, like a, a convenience store gas retailer, like a like a Sheets or Royal Farms or Turkey Hills or a Wawa or a 7-Eleven, like any, any one of these operators, okay? They come into a neighborhood, they find a corner lot that 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 makes, you know, fits all their, their real estate parameters of what they're looking for. Now they go in, they want to buy the lot. Say the lot is, I don't know, 2 million bucks. So they want to go buy this lot. And now they go to the township and they go to the township for approvals. And the township basically comes back to them and says, sure, no problem. Uh, we'll grant your approval, but you need to pay $2 million to redo the entire intersection because, you know, it, the intersection is really going to need all new lighting and, you know, all new lights. And we're going to have to put up all new signage and we're going to need new curbs and uh, and new sidewalks. And, and we're going to have to put a turn lane in over here. And so, you know, the only way that we can make this uh, plausible is, is for, you know, for you as the developer to pay those fees to redo all that. Now, uh, now that's great for the township because the township then gets to go back to its residents and say, hey, look, we didn't have to raise any taxes and we got this whole thing redone by the developer. But but to the developer, the impact fees, uh, that becomes, in, in my mind, basically a legal shakedown. Like, in other words, if you don't pay this, you got to pay to play, basically. Uh, if you don't pay this, you don't get your permits. Therefore, you can't develop your property. And, and there you go. So. Uh, and, and this, and like you said, and I, I think that um, what has brought this on is that there's a lot of people in the real estate business, a lot of developers who, like it's like the article said, have been chafing at the fact that you know, hey man, why you know, the, like in other words, uh, townships keep reaching with the impact fees and and like where they can be applied, how they can be applied, how much they can ask for. So uh, this, so again. Any any bankers out there that are financing commercial real estate projects of any kind should be paying attention to this. If you work with developers, if you work with home builders, um, so this this could have ripple effects across the U.S. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll have to see what happens. So uh, a couple other interesting things: uh, the hidden cost of home, a hidden cost of home ownership, is mounting and approaching crisis levels. So the cost of home ownership or the cost of um, home insurance. Insurance Marketplace, uh, Insurify Inc. projected homeowners insurance would rise about 6% in 2024 after roughly 20% annual rate increases between 2021 and 2023. Uh, that would bring the average rate to $2,522 by the end of the year. 
but states are not seeing equal increases. Florida's rate is expected to go up 7% in 2024 with an average payment of 11,759 a year. Louisiana will see a 23% price hike in 2024 to 7,809 per year. Um, and Surefy attributed the bigger increases in those states to a higher risk of damage from natural disasters and the rising costs of building repairs. Meanwhile, more than a dozen home insurance companies have declared insolvency since 2019 in Florida, according to Insurify. Uh, when insurance companies cannot cover the cost of natural disasters, reinsurance companies, essentially insurance companies for insurance companies step in at a cost. Um, so that's just really interesting. So again, I mean, I mean, obviously all costs are going up right now. Uh, when you're thinking about a house, you're, you're talking about, you know, property taxes, all of the utility bills, your insurance, your maintenance, lawn care, the whole jazz, everything's going up, but, but, um, policy premiums for homeowners insurance are, have really gone up in the last four years. And in certain States, they've gone up big time. So again, just something we have to keep an eye on. This is a huge one businesses face systemic shift after the FTC bans non-complete non-competes. So the Federal Trade Commission finalized a rule banning non-compete agreements on Tuesday, but that does not mean businesses and managers need to race to toss out their existing employment agreements. Uh, that's because the final rule slated to go into effect in 120 days will be met with legal challenges. It will take time to play out. Oh, and they were met. They were been sued by, I think everybody under the sun has sued them for this. Um, you know, what employees should do after FTC, FTC non-compete ban. So businesses should still take stock of their existing employment agreements and reevaluate the use of non-competes for new hires. Uh, that could include using narrowly tailored non-disclosure agreements uh, that do not rise to the level of non-competes, as well as non-solicitation agreements if they are legal in a business owner state. Businesses can also think outside the restrictive covenant box and revisit ways to increase employee loyalty through additional compensation, mentoring, training, and work-life balance. Uh, you know, businesses should reassess non-competes after the FTC ban. Change is already happening at the state level, uh, and there are some exceptions to the FTC's non-compete ban. But here, here's the thing. The, the Federal Trade Commission, I think they dramatically overstepped their bound with this ruling. Um, and, and this is where, you know, I, you know, I in particular get really annoyed. You know, I mean, they, this is this is, you know, big time, big brother government overreach, you know, and on first class display right here where the FTC just comes out and just says, hey, you know what? We just decided this week that we don't like, you know, non-compete agreements. So we're just going to get we're just going to ban them. Just, you know, nobody can have them. Um, that, that's not their place. That's not, it's not their place to do that. It's not their place to make that judgment. Um, you know, that's something that's just left. To the labor market let the labor market figure that out uh that you know the, this is not something that the ftc needed to get involved with they didn't need to step into this they didn't need to make uh this this decision um there and there are the reality is there are some places where non-competes are very much needed you just they, they you have to have them in place there are certain industries there are certain jobs that they have to have this from a competitive standpoint in order to be able to do, you know, do their job, operate their business, you know, all, all so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see. I mean, obviously, again, like I said, they've been sued. They're, there's obviously tons of litigation uh, coming out of this. Uh, I will be surprised if this stands up and, and holds up in court after all the, the lawsuits and litigation go through. Uh, but we'll see. But again, it was it was it's big news. That's big news. It's a very big thing. And, and you know, every you know, there, there are, are banks across the country. Uh, that that is going to affect in one way, shape or form. And obviously, you know, the thousands of businesses, uh, you know, across the country that that's going to affect as well. So, um, OK. And then the last thing here I just wanted to get into before I hit a bunch of the news items. So Joe Biden this week uh, basically made a proposal to do a couple of new taxes. He wants to he wants to basically tax. Um, he wants to increase the capital gains tax, and he wants to propose a new tax on unrealized capital gains. Uh, I can't even begin to explain how monumentally terrible uh, those taxes would be, you know. And, and it's very, it's very infuriating because, you know, the the government has created this mess with the high inflation, uh, with the out of control spending. 
And now they need more taxes to cover the bill that they know is come and due. And they're, so their answer to this is to tax us further into oblivion. And I'm going to I'm going to tell everybody there is a there's a book that I read many years ago by uh, Fre Frederick uh, Bastiat was a French economist. He wrote a book and I think it was 1851 and it's called The Law. And the law is all a book. The law is that book is just as relevant today as it was written, you know, 170 years ago. And the law is about what's called legal plunder. It's about all the ways that the government uses taxation to legally plunder the citizenry and about how you have to watch out for it. You have to push back against it. You do. You cannot allow the basically the government to just, you know, have legal theft and just legally plunder your money. And that's exactly what these taxes are. This this notion that somehow um, these are just things that are going to affect the rich. I mean, it's 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 absolutely preposterous. You know, I don't care if you own a house that's worth that's worth one hundred thousand dollars. You know, it, you, you're going to have to pay tax if you haven't sold it and you owe uh, you have a twenty thousand dollar mortgage on that house. You're, you've got eighty thousand dollars in equity. Oh, well, you're now going to have to pay tax on that unrealized gain. Um, if you've got a million dollars sitting in a four hundred one k account, and you haven't taken that money out. Oh, well, you know, you you over the course of the last twenty years, you've accumulated four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in gains in that four hundred one k account. Well, guess what? That's unrealized gains. You're going to have to pay taxes on that. I mean, it's just the whole thing is just absurd on his face. And, and I, I hope, a, I hope this did there. I hope this just gets blown out of the water. I hope that gets a lot of pushback on this because this, these are absolutely ridiculous. I mean, if you, if you want some taxes that will just basically plunder and bury what's left of the middle class in this country, uh, these, these taxes will do it. The other thing is that, you know, if you want to disenfranchise anybody from, from trying to even accumulate wealth, from trying to go out there and invest and, and different types of assets and real estate and businesses and stocks. Uh, go ahead and pass these taxes. Go ahead and pass these taxes. That, that will this will, this will be the death knell to anybody in this country trying to go out and realistically try to build wealth, try to accumulate wealth. And, and let me tell you something: the rich at the end of the day, your billionaires, they don't care. They they don't care. Like they like they, this tax, they'll just pay the tax, okay? And and what they'll do is they'll get their army of lawyers and lobbyists to go put in tax loopholes in other areas to make it up for them. That's all. That's all that will happen because that's what that's what always happens. And it's 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 ridiculous. And, um, you know, and, and it's just so. So, I, again, I hope I hope I hope this is I hope this gets blown out of the water and I get, hope it gets pushed back for the ab absurdity of, uh, of of what it is on its face. So but anyway, all right, that's my rant. All right. Let's get into some some news here uh, before we get uh, finished up here for the day. So, OK, what do we got here? Uh, let's go. With, okay. So the, uh, commodities futures trading commission is questioning big wall street banks, including JP Morgan chase and bank of America and Citigroup over non-disclosure agreements in their swaps and clearing businesses to see whether they gag potential whistleblowers. Bloomberg news reported citing for people familiar with the matter. The, the CFTC probe expands on similar government investigations on the alleged use of confidentiality agreements to discourage staff or clients from reporting violations. According to the report, uh, funds in J.P. Morgan bank accounts in Russia were ordered seized by a Russian court in a lawsuit filed by state-owned bank VTB Bank, uh, Reuters reported, citing court filings. Last week, the largest U.S. bank sued VTB to prevent it from recovering $439 million from a blocked account after Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, Cadence Bank's commercial and industrial portfolio drove an increase in the bank's non-performing loans. The Toledo, Mississippi-based company reported a rise in non-performing assets to $246 million in the first quarter, up from $222 million in the fourth quarter of 2023. Commercial and industrial non-performing loans and leases increased to $155 million from $138 million, while commercial real estate non-performing loans and leases increased to $23 million from $19.3 million. Um, Old National Bank Corp reported quarter over quarter and year over year deposit growth despite continued intense competition. Uh, Webster Financial Corp plans to reduce its commercial real estate concentration through loan sales, executives said in an earnings conference call. Um, Dime Community Bank shares hopes to bring in up to $400 million in deposits in the fourth quarter with the teams it hired from New York Community Bank Corp earlier this month. Dime was one of three banks to poach several deposit gathering teams from New York Community. 
Former Jane Street Group LLC trader Douglas uh, Schwadewald uh, pill pilloried his former employer as he denied the company's charges that he and a fellow defector, Daniel Spottiswood, used Jane Street's proprietary tr strategy and their new jobs at rival Millennium Management. Bloomberg News reported, uh, citing Sh Schadewald's, I'm going to have fun with that name, uh, response to a lawsuit filed by Jane Street this month. The alleged secret strategy involves option trading in India, according to the report. So here's just a little side note. Um, there's a little guy named Sam Bankman Freed, who was a trader at Jane Street before he left to go start FTX. So, um, yeah, maybe Jane Street's not the uh, not the most, uh, you know, reputable firm out there. We'll put it that way. So, OK. Uh, anyway, so moving on. Uh, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission is in talks with several firms looking to become central clearinghouses for U.S. Treasuries and derivatives trading under the agency's new rule that aims to fortify the world's largest debt market. Bloomberg News reported, citing SEC Trading and Markets Division Director uh, Hayoziang Hayo Zhu's remark during a virtual discussion. Okay. Let me move on here. I know there's a couple other big things I wanted to hit here. So, okay. FDIC board member Jonathan McKernan and Chair Martin Grudenberg are working on proposals that would demand asset managers hold more than 10%, asset managers holding more than 10% of a bank's shares to make sure they remain passive investors in such banks. The Financial Times reported, citing McKernan, asset managers are worried that the proposals would raise compliance costs and make it difficult for investors to take large stakes in banks. According to the report, asset management giant BlackRock Inc. has 10% or more stake in 38 bank holding companies that are supervised by the Fed or the OCC, but which own FDIC supervised banks, while Vanguard Group Bank has more than 10% stake in at least one bank that is directly supervised by the FDIC, uh, FT noted. So obviously, yes, this is a huge thing. Um, I have said for a long time that BlackRock, Straight, State Street, and Vanguard have way too much influence over a lot of companies, a lot of banks in particular, and they should not own more than 10% in these banks. And basically they should have something that if they can't stop them from owning the stock, uh, they should have some kind of restriction on there that basically makes them a passive investor and does not allow them to simply dictate, uh, you know, what these banks are going to do and how they're going to be run and so on and so forth. So, um, okay. BlackRock, uh, more BlackRock news. So BlackRock more than tripled its spending to upgrade the home security systems at chairman and CEO Larry Fink's residence in 2023 after the executive became a target for anti-woke activists and conspiracy theorists. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, since the since the launch of the bank term funding pro program, the BTFP in March of 2023, uh, 1,804 depository institutions have tapped the emergency lending facility of which 1,706 or 95% were small institutions with total assets below $10 billion, the Federal Reserve disclosed in its semi-annual financial stability report. Uh, the BTFP, which was created to help financial institutions cope with liquidity concerns following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, ceased extending new loans on March 11th. So again, yeah, that's a, that's a, Big thing. Uh, I didn't think that the Federal Reserve should close the BTFP. I felt like they should have just perhaps extended it for six months and just kind of give it a little time, waited to see what happened, and then you know, and then and then maybe went from there. So, but uh, I will have um, the the Fed's semi-annual financial stability report. I will be doing on an episode on that for next weekend. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, and then I wanted to wrap this part of it up here. I've got some Capital One and Discover Card merger news. If people might remember, I did an episode on that a few weeks back between the you know Capital One buying Discover Card. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond sent at least two requests for additional information to Capital One for its planned acquisition of Discover Financial Services, questioning how Capital One has prepared for its uh, future size once the deal closes. 
And in the second request for additional information sent on April 12th, the Fed asked Capital One how the deal would impact its current resolution plan and whether it is preparing to comply with the regulatory standards for a Category 2 bank. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board extended the public comment period for the application of Capital One Financial Court to acquire Discover Financial Services through May 31st from April 26th. The office, the OCC, also extended the public comment period for the application of Capital One Unit um, until 5 p.m. on May 31st from April 22nd. Um, it's standard practice for the Federal Reserve to extend the comment period on bank mergers. We expected the extension and we don't take any signaling on our deal from the Fed's decision here, said Richard Fairbank, Capital One's founder, chairman, and CEO. Well, that is that's that's absolutely true, and that probably is right. However, that is not the tune that they were singing uh, when they signed this deal a couple, uh, maybe about a month or so ago, where uh, you know they said, "Oh, we're going to get this thing done. It's super super fast. And, you know, you know, lickety split, and it's all going to go smooth and everything else." Now we get the CFPB director. Uh, warned of the effects of large deals on competition and financial stability in the credit card industry. Uh, while Chopper declined to comment specifically on the deal between Capital One and Discover Financial, he alluded to the transaction saying it requires some very, very close analysis. So, yeah, so I think that any hope that they had of getting this deal done quickly pretty much went right out the window. And it doesn't seem like the feds are all that, you know, super excited about having this deal in here. So, okay, so let's look at some other stuff real quick. So uh, Fed's financial stability report highlights key risks. Yeah, I'll talk about that later. Uh, FinCEN, 27 billion in elder financial exploitation reported by financial institutions. So you've got a lot of elder fraud going on out there. ICBE, ICBA meets with the CFPB on 1033 concerns. That is, that is open banking. Um, and so during the meeting, they encouraged the CFPB not to require banks to provide tokenized account numbers in lieu of routing and account numbers, which would be too complex to require as part of the rulemaking. That's very interesting. They want banks to provide tokenized account numbers. Why would you want banks to provide tokenized account numbers? I just can't, man. Yeah, I can't understand, man. Maybe a central bank digital currency. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe something there. Um, they also expressed concern that community banks will be dependent on their core processors to create compliance software. Yes, they will. Said the data security practices of third-party data recipients remain a serious concern and the Bureau should actively supervise third parties to ensure adequate safeguards of customers' personal financial information. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if you want more information on that, go and see my episode on open banking. Okay, uh, Labor Department finalizes opposed overtime rule. The Labor Department issued a final rule to increase the number of employees who are totaled to overtime compensation. The G7 conducts a cross-border cyber exercise. Treasury announced that the G7 Cyber Expert Group last week completed a cross-border cybersecurity coordination exercise. Uh, the exercise was designed to strengthen the ability of G7 financial authorities to coordinate responses in the event of a significant cross-border cyber incident affecting the financial sector. The exercise assumed a large-scale cyber attack on financial market infrastructures and entities in all G7 jurisdictions. That's very interesting. Um, I find the timing of that very interesting, but we'll, uh, but we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Uh, okay, so new home sales rise in March. Sales of new home sales uh, increased 8.8% in March and were up 8.3% from a year ago. Uh, the median sale price was $430,000, up from $406,000 in February. Uh, we already talked about that. DOJ targets founders of major crypto mixer. The Justice Department uh, charged the heads of a major crypto mixer with conspiracy to commit money laundering and operating an unlicensed money transmitting business. So I think this was more... Uh, this, oh, this was called Samurai's, uh, Samurai Wallet. Malicious actors used crypto mixers such as Samurai Wallet and Tornado Cash to launder stolen digital assets. So interesting. That could be another, uh, crypto series episode. Uh, durable good orders grow in March. Uh, the commerce re reported that new orders for manufacturing durable goods increased 2.6% in March. 
Uh, GDP rises 1.6% in quarter one advance estimate. The gross domestic product increased at an annual rate of 1.6% in the first quarter, following a 3.4% increase the previous quarter. Um, the increase primarily reflects increases in consumer spending, residential fixed investment, non-residential fixed investment, and state and local government spending, which were partly offset by a decrease in private inventory investment. Um, yeah, so I have a whole lot. I mean, obviously that is a collapse. That's not a, you know, that that's not, they, they try to spin this as like, it's a good number that we got a 1.6% uh, increase in GDP. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Uh, GDP basically collapsed. And the only reason it was positive was because of all the government spending. They're, they're, they're putting out a ridiculous amount of government spending to buy growth. And if you take that out of the equation, you're left with negative growth. And, you know, and I've been saying that for a while now that it's just, it's, it's the GDP is just ridiculous. And I'll probably do, I'll probably, I might even add the GDP to when I do the uh, updated jobs episode, which I'll, which I'll hopefully have coming out next weekend. So, uh, okay. I have a lot more stuff here, but just don't have quite enough time here to get to uh, all of this uh, right now. So I'm basically going to wrap up the episode. So I hope, hope everybody enjoyed uh, another, uh, another action-packed episode here this week. Uh, a lot continues to happen in the banking industry. There's just all kinds of stuff happening at the moment. Um, I do have to apologize. I was not able to put the finishing touches this week on the next uh, couple of episodes of the Lords of Easy Money, uh, but those will be, look for those during the week this week. Um, I will be doing um, uh, basically episodes 11 and 12 will be coming out, which is chapters nine and 10. Uh, so I will have those two coming out this week. And then I'm hoping because there's there's uh, I think there are 16, no, eight, 18. There's 18 chapters in the book. So I'm, I'm hoping to get through the last, you know, seven chapters fairly quickly. I'm, I'm hoping to be able to kind of plunge into that and maybe do two and maybe do two of those a week for the next like three weeks or so and just and just kind of get that just kind of get that out there and get that uh series finalized there just so we can kind of get to the end a little bit quicker so keep an eye out for the lord's easy money episodes during the week this week and then next weekend i'm going to come back i've got about uh it's probably about six or seven episodes uh slated to come out next weekend for a range of topics that I'm, I'm working on that i haven't been able to to get to here for the last week or so but a lot of stuff that's got to be reviewed and that i got to get to so uh okay we'll keep an eye on that and and like i said if you didn't get a chance to check out those two interviews with brian nestor and and uh bob white the ceo of first uh colonial bank please go on and check those out that would really really help and would really make me happy if a lot of people viewed those episodes so <laughs> but um until later in the week i hope everybody enjoys the rest of the weekend if you haven't gotten outside get out there yet i hope it's nice wherever you're at and uh and like i said i will see everybody again next weekend and please make sure to check us out on youtube rumble and all major podcast platforms and as always if you like this episode please make sure to like share and subscribe and leave your comments that always always helps out the channel and I will see everybody again real soon.